This is the last chord from Dancing Song by Claire Fisher. And it's the chord of the week. Keith Horns, chord of the week. Claire Fisher, in my view, is one of the great geniuses of music of any era. He's just absolutely brilliant. I mean, imagine if Bach and A.C. Joe Beam and Bartok started a jazz combo. That's Claire Fisher. This is unique. Musicians have the utmost respect for his work, and most people don't even know his name, but everyone has heard his work as an arranger for artists like Natalie Cole, Paul McCartney, Rufus and Shaka Khan, and most notably, Prince. <coughs> Claire Fisher is the man responsible for that lush orchestral sound you hear from Prince's music 1985, uh, the album The Family, all the way well up into the 2000s. It was a 20, 25 year relationship. And all those really rich harmonies you hear in orchestrations that you hear in Prince's music, that's Claire Fisher. Here are a couple examples of that. In 1998, Claire Fisher visited Western Michigan University, where I was a music student at the time, and he gave a lecture that blew my mind. I mean, he gave us these handouts that he had just written out that day, and uh, these three pages, which I still have, I learned so much from, and I still refer back to, you know, 25, you know, 20-some years later. And he played a voicing of a C major 7 chord like this. And it's so simple, and... It has the root, the root at the top and the seventh at the bottom, creating a minor third in the major seven tonality. And I thought, wait, we can do that? We, we can do that? Which brings me to this week's chord from Dancing Song. It's a C major seven, sharp 11. Now, I have to say, Claire Fisher did not use terms like sharp 11 or, or flat nine or sharp nine. He always said that things need to be called raised or lowered or plus and minus are the terms that he always used. His argument was if you take, say, a C7 sharp nine, the sharp nine is an E flat. How are you gonna call a sharp nine an E flat? Yeah, that's weird, right? He always called it a C7 plus nine, a raised ninth. So I'll be correcting myself because I'm not used to using uh, the terms and nomenclature of Claire Fisher, but uh, in solidarity with his tradition, uh, with the way he liked to do things, uh, I'll be attempting to remember to call this a C major 7 plus 11. Of course, what makes this so unique is the voicing. I mean, you have this minor second here, which is interesting, but not all that unique. It's this, this minor ninth that makes it so unique. It's like he just took a more traditional voicing, like that, where you have the seventh in the top and a doubled root in the middle or maybe even a ninth. He took these two voices and he just flip-flopped them. Flip-flopping this <laughs> You ever seen a mother <laughs> flip-flop on you and <laughs> like that in your face? Go crazy to be flipping this <laughs> Here's the chord again in another version of Dancing Song from the album The Latin Side, where now it's in D. <laughs> same chord, same piece, different recording, step up, big band. What's not to like? Here's another variation of the chord from Brent Fisher, who's the son of Claire Fisher. And Brent carries on his dad's tradition. His, his, his dad's music is amazing, and nobody knows it better than Brent Fisher. I had the privilege of, of studying with him for a few years, and he was tapped to do a full arrangement of every movement of pictures at an exhibition by a Mazorski. Here's the last chord of that piece. <laughs> Now, when asked about this, he said he used the dancing song chord 
as his inspiration for this voicing. And the dancing song voicing is in there. But he also has a ninth, a sixth, a doubled ninth, and a doubled fifth. I mean, that is a rich, balanced breakfast. Part of a balanced breakfast and delicious? Now, just as interesting as the last chord is the second to last chord, which serves the function as a dominant to the last chord's tonic. Now, the second to last chord, it's, it is a dominant, but it's not your grandmother's dominant. It's not your grandmother's G7 because it doesn't have a third. It doesn't have the B in it. Here's the voicing. You could look at it a couple different ways. In the center of it, you have what is essentially a B flat seven sus, and then it's sandwiched by a couple of Gs. But really, it's a G7 plus five plus nine minus nine no third, which serves as a dominant. It, it's like I'm ordering a cup of coffee. Yes, can I get a G7 plus five split nine no third and a shot of holiday spice? Thanks. All right, let's take the last two chords of dancing song through some exercises. First, we'll take the chord counterclockwise around the circle of fifths, like this. next exercise is to take the last two chords and play it through the same circle of fifths authentically this way. And what I'm going to do is build like this. We have the two roots, add the inner voices, and then do the same. So that sounds like this. And from C to F. So those are the last two chords from Claire Fisher's dancing song. Now, this piece deserves an entire semester worth of study. There's so much in there, but these last two chords are really interesting. I'd like to do another video where I just talk about the opening bar because just the harmonic techniques that he uses, they really push the limits of functional harmony and they're a natural progression of the jazz language, of the language of Bach in many ways. And I've been studying him for about 10, 12 years, and I feel like I'm just now starting to wrap my head around him. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Listen to more Claire Fisher, and happy practicing. Yeah. Who this? This beat. Yo, who this? Yo, who this? Who this?